Hello, welcome to this newest edition of the 12 Days in March review series for Step 1. My name is Karen Malour. You might remember me from the JV portion of the testicular tumor video in the urology and men's health section of the 12 Days in March website. Well, in today's lesson, I'm switching gears a bit and discussing the anatomy of the rotator cuff and what you need to know when thinking about the rotator cuff pathology for Step 1. I'll be going into detail about how board examiners may come after you with questions related to this topic, so nothing comes as a surprise come test day. As a reminder, a free PDF of this slideshow will be available on the 12 Days in March website. That's enough dilly dally, let's jump in and let's have some fun. If we hearken back to those beloved formaldehyde filled days of anatomy, recall that the rotator cuff is comprised of four muscles, all of which help firmly hold our arm bone the humerus in the shallow socket of the shoulder called the glenoid. There are four muscles of the rotator cuff that can be easily remembered by the acronym SITS. S for supraspinatus, I for infraspinatus, T for teres minor, and S for subscapularis. When we talk about the rotator cuff injuries, we're specifically talking about injury to one of those four muscles. Something to be familiar with is the term impingement. This is just a way of referring to pain secondary to nerve involvement when the rotator cuff is inflamed. For purposes of step one, knowing the nitty gritty details of where the muscles originate and insert is fairly low yield. So with that being said, what do you need to focus on for step one? When it comes to questions related to the rotator cuff anatomy and injuries, there are very few ways board examiners have of going after you. Nailing questions on the rotator cuff will require that you have a good understanding of the function of the rotator cuff muscles, the nerves that are responsible for their innervations, and being able to interpret physical exam to isolate the muscle involved in the question. Thankfully, for each rotator cuff muscle, I'll describe some of the key phrases and exam findings test writers love to use when talking about related pathology. So what will a typical question sound like? It'll probably sound something like, a man or woman presents with shoulder pain. They're found to have weakness or pain with some physical exam maneuver as stated in the vignette. The question is likely to ask one of the following things. One, what rotator cuff muscle is likely to have been affected? Two. The muscle in question is innervated by what nerve or slash originates from what nerve roots in the brachial plexus? Three, what other motions will the patient have trouble doing? Four, what is the primary role of the muscle involved? And five, which is fairly low yield and something that we will not focus a lot in this video, is where does the muscle in question insert or originate? So now that we know how they'll be coming after you on the exam, let's jump into the key features to know about the rotator cuff muscles. The first and most commonly tested rotator cuff muscle on step one is the supraspinatus muscle. This is a favorite for board examiners because it's also the most commonly injured muscle of the rotator cuff. The supraspinatus functions to initiate abduction of the shoulder. The key point to be familiar with about this muscle is that it is responsible for the first 15 degrees of abduction of the shoulder. Do you remember what muscle is responsible for abduction of the arm up till 90 degrees? That's right, the deltoid. Remember, the deltoid is not a rotator cuff muscle. The supraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve, which comes from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, injuries to the supraspinatus are most commonly described on the exam as pain with resisted abduction or a positive empty can test, which we'll talk about in just a second. Suspect a full thickness tear in the supraspinatus if on the exam, the patient is unable to keep their arm abducted on their own. In other words, when their arm is abducted and they're asked to slowly bring their arms back down to their side, their arm actually falls like a dead weight. Okay, let's try a question. We got a 62 year old lady with shoulder pain after being a loving grandma and helping her granddaughter move into college. On exam, when asked to have her arms abducted to 90 degrees and flexed to 30 degrees with her thumbs facing down, her left arm is notably weak and painful as the examiner applies downward pressure. So let's go through our answer choices here and figure out what's the right one. How about A, thoracodorsal nerve? Well, that innervates the latissimus dorsi in the back. This patient has shoulder pain. And remember, when on the exam you see something related to shoulder pain, you gotta be thinking about the rotator cuff, not muscles of the back. How about B, a radial nerve injury? Remember, your radial nerve is the quote-unquote great extensor nerve of the forearm musculature. 
Injuries to the radial nerve are usually secondary to mid-shaft humeral fractures, and patients on exam vignettes will classically have a wrist drop. For our case, this woman is presenting with shoulder pain, not with a wrist drop or any signs of radial nerve injury. How about the subscapular nerve, C? Well, this innervates the subscapularis muscle, which we'll talk about in just a second, which is a rotator cuff muscle, but an injury to this muscle would impact internal rotation of the arm, not abduction like we see in this patient. How about the musculocutaneous nerve? This is just a pesky distractor, unfortunately. Remember, this helps innervate the muscles responsible for flexion of the arm at the elbow. So what's left? That leaves D, the suprascapular nerve. Remember, this patient has shoulder pain and pain with resisted abduction on exam. She has a positive empty can test, which is the exam maneuver that they've described in this vignette. Here's an examiner demonstrating the empty can test to test for supraspinatus integrity. It will be described on step one, similar to how it was described in this vignette, as the examiner having the patient abduct the arms to 90 degrees with arms flexed to 30 degrees with the thumbs pointing down. The examiner then places downward force on the patient's forearms and instructs the patient to resist. If the patient describes weakness or pain while attempting to resist, this is considered a positive empty can test. Next, let's talk about the infraspinatus and the teres minor muscles of the rotator cuff. I've included them together because I find it easy to think about them together given their function is essentially the same. Both primarily are responsible for laterally or externally rotating the arm. One key difference, however, is both muscles have separate innervations. The infraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve. Now remember, what other rotator cuff muscle have we talked about that is also innervated by the suprascapular nerve? Bingo, the supraspinatus. The teres minor, on the other hand, is innervated by the axillary nerve. Injuries related to either the infraspinatus or teres minor are often related to repeated overhead motion, as seen in volleyball players or baseball pitchers. Although not high yield for step one, I've included a simple way of distinguishing the difference between the two given that they both externally rotate the shoulder. I've attached this slide just for reference to demonstrate how an examiner might test the integrity of the infraspinatus or the teres minor on physical exam. In this demonstration, as seen in the figure, the patient attempts to externally rotate the arm against resistance while the arm is at the side and the elbows are flexed to 90 degrees. The final muscle of the rotator cuff is the subscapularis. It functions to medially rotate and adduct the arm. It is innervated by, like its name, the subscapular nerve. Injuries to the subscapularis are rare in isolation, and you are unlikely to see questions specifically related to subscapularis injury. And boom, that's it. Let's recap the high yield info. So we have four rotator cuff muscles. Remember the acronym SITS, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. For the supraspinatus, Remember its function with the initial abduction and innervation via the suprascapular nerve. Don't forget that on the exam, patients can have pain with resisted abduction and a positive empty can test. And remember how they describe an empty can test on clinical vignettes. Think about the infraspinatus and teres minor together. The teres minor is innervated by the axillary nerve, while both the supra and infraspinatus get innervation from the suprascapular nerve. How about another question? So here we have a 47 year old gent with right shoulder pain. On exam, he has pain with resisted abduction of the right shoulder. So what does this make us think? Right, likely a rotator cuff injury specifically with involvement of the supraspinatus. So let's go through our answer choices. How about A, adhesive capsulitis, also known as frozen shoulder? Well, remember this is characterized by a decreased range of motion in the shoulder and usually causes stiffness rather than pain or weakness. How about glenohumeral arthritis? This isn't really likely in a middle-aged patient with subacute shoulder pain. So that leaves us with a complete tear in the supraspinatus or rotator cuff tendonitis. So this patient injured his rotator cuff. While the supraspinatus is likely to be involved here, the key word that eliminates this answer is complete. 
In the vignette, the patient is able to slowly and smoothly lower his right arm to his side, which is the test writer's sneaky way of telling you that there's not a complete tear in the supraspinatus. Had there been a complete tear in the supraspinatus, you might hear in the vignette that the patient is unable to smoothly move his arm back down to his side or his arm drops completely, almost like a dead weight. So that leaves the correct answer, rotator cuff tendonitis. And this is a classic vignette for a patient with tendonitis. And let's try one more question. This question is a tad annoying, but I want to include it here for completeness. So we have a 34 year old female here. She's status post motor vehicle accident, who now has an injury to her shoulder. This question is asking you not only to be familiar with the rotator cuff, but where in the brachial plexus the nerves that innervate the rotator cuff muscles originate. So the correct answer here is A. Remember, for step one, just know that the nerves that innervate the rotator cuff originate at the C5 to C7 roots. The superior trunk and posterior cord both give rise to the nerves that go on to innervate the muscles of the rotator cuff. And that's it for the rotator cuff. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. Good luck with all of your studying. This is Kieran once again, signing off.